Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful that you've given us eyes to see and ears to hear and lips to proclaim your praises. Thank you. Thank you for this time that we could worship you through song. And now as we continue our worship through hearing and heeding your word, I pray that your spirit will pour out a great blessing upon us and uh, accept our inability to understand your truth on our own. So we need your spirit to help us to understand what you have in store for us and the eternal implications of the passages we'll be seeing today. So please uh, cause us to uh, tremble at your word, convict us where we are wrong, Comfort us where we are weak and struggling. Uh, and uh, I also pray, Lord, that you would give us all a holy resolve to live according to the life that you call us to live. Please have mercy. Help us to accomplish this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, last week um, we uh, started a mini-series I had titled as I Have Sinned, Sign of False or True, repentance. And I explained what led me to uh, start that series was, uh, you know, we've been going through the gospel of uh, Matthew for quite some time now. And um, uh, in um, uh, Matthew, we're at Matthew 27 uh, and verse 4, where Judas has now uh, uh, betrayed Jesus. He sees what is going to happen to Jesus, that he was condemned to death. And when he saw that um, Judas said uh, these words in Matthew 27 verse 4, I have sinned for I have betrayed innocent blood. And I also explained uh, those three words that Judas said, I have sinned, led me to think a little more about, um, while it's important that we, we must acknowledge sin, but the Bible also gives many examples of those who said, I have sinned and yet ended up in hell. And I said, that's what really made me focus on examining our own lives to see, because even true believers, true Christians also say I have sinned, because that is part of saving faith. But I have sinned is also part of those who don't have that saving faith. So how can we know that we are truly believers, true followers of Jesus? Is just saying I have sinned alone enough or is there something more to it? And that's why the series uh, uh, started to help us understand the significance of the words I have sinned. And in, in the last message we saw six examples of those who said I have sinned. And some also said it more than once. Some even had tears. And yet they did not display genuine saving faith. And from there, we looked at 10 characteristics, or I said we're going to look at 10 characteristics of true repentance. Those who say I've sinned, I'm sorry, 10 characteristics of false repentance. Uh, my coffee just hasn't kicked in yet. Uh, 10 characteristics of false repentance. Meaning, you can say I've sinned and still display a repentance that is false. We looked at five of those. We're going to look at the remaining five today. But for the benefit of uh, those who were not here last week, as well as for those who were here, just so that we have the flow, we're going to look at the six examples of those who said, I have sinned, and uh, the five characteristics of false repentance. And then we'll look at the other five today. I'm going to be really brief as we go through this. We saw... In addition to Judas, five other people said, I have sinned, but they were really not God's children. They were, they were false. Uh, the, the words were false according to what the scripture said. Number one, we looked at Pharaoh. At least on two occasions, Pharaoh said, I have sinned, but went back to his old way of living. Second, we saw the disobedient Israelites in the wilderness. They see the 
two spies come back and give a good report, but the ten spies discourage them and some people join them. And when God promised judgment upon them, they said, we have sinned. But they went back to disobeying God and tried to go in to the land on their own. And third, we saw Balaam. Uh, he started out or seemingly started out good, but the Bible clearly tells us he was a false prophet. Even though he said, I have sinned, he was a man, not after God's own heart, man after money. And the fourth one was Achan. We saw him. When he was caught in his act, he also said, I have sinned. But his confession was not genuine. That brought about judgment not only on Achan, but his entire family. And then we saw Saul, the first king of Israel. He also said, I have sinned, but Saul's life did not end up too well. Now, now, now Saul is a little tricky character. Was Saul a believer who was just messed up? Or was Saul an unbeliever who pretended uh, to be uh, God's child? It's, it's a, a, those who favor Saul as a believer who had a lot of weaknesses usually build uh, that, um, that conclusion based on, you don't need to turn to it, but you can uh, listen to me. In 1 Samuel 28, 8, 19, Saul now knows God has left him. David's being lifted up in power and God has removed his hand from Saul. So the Philistine army is attacking and Saul panics. So he even goes to a witch and uh, brings up Samuel who was dead a while ago. And Samuel tells him in 1 Samuel 28, 19, The Lord will deliver both Israel and you into the hands of the Philistines and tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. The Lord will also give the army of Israel into the hands of the Philistines. That phrase, tomorrow you and your sons will be with me, they conclude that meaning Saul did end up in heaven because we know Jonathan was a true believer and Samuel was in heaven. You're with me. But also that idea of with me has the idea of in the realm of the dead. You're not going to be alive. You're going to be killed. So I lean a little more towards that. Uh, but, but the idea again is, these people did say I have sinned and their life did not end up well. That, that's the uh, overall point I want to uh, uh, make across, I mean get, get it across to us. Um, and finally, we, the example of the sixth one was Judas. He, in, the, in fact, Matthew tells us that he was even filled with remorse. There was kind of a repentance there, but not a repentance that leads to life. A repentance that led to his eternal death. And then from there we looked at the first five characteristics of false repentance. Because these people did say I have sinned. Those words I have sinned is required of true saving faith. These people said this. But they didn't have true saving faith. So we looked at five. Five characteristics. Characteristics number one of false repentance is equating feelings of sorrow alone as evidence of true repentance. I mean, feeling sad alone does not mean that we have true saving faith. Because even those who don't know anything about Jesus, their conscience convicts them. They feel sad for doing something wrong. But that doesn't mean they've put their faith in Jesus. Judas and Esau are classic examples. They felt remorse. Esau, the Bible says, even had tears. Yet, Esau was a godless man. Hebrews 12, verse 16. Second characteristic of false repentance we saw is confessing or acknowledging sin without turning from it. Without turning from it. We looked at Balaam. Balaam acknowledged his sin. I have sinned. Yet, he kept going forward because the love of money had such a death grip on him. He lost his soul. It's one thing to say, I'm sorry. But another thing, to give up the sin. Third characteristic of false repentance we saw was that some people repent only to escape present consequences, not because they really hate sin. I just need to get out of this mess. God, Fix me. Get me out of this. I'll clean my life. The focus is only so that 
I get out of this particular mess. Not because I truly hate sin for what it is. Pharaoh was like that, wasn't he? When those plagues came, Moses just prayed to God, remove this. And once that was removed, went back to his old ways. We were like that often. You know, we say, God, just get me out of this. I promise you, we make all these promises, vows, and then once that goes away, okay, God's cooled off. I can cool off too in my pursuit of holiness. Characteristic number four we saw was a false repentance. We saw was equating penance as evidence of true repentance. Equating penance, trying to earn forgiveness by our own works. Now, there are times when we have to make restitution. But we sang earlier, right, about everything we have is because of Jesus and the cross. Forgiveness cannot be earned. It can only be received. When we try to earn forgiveness through penance, we've destroyed the gospel of grace. And when that happens, it shows its false repentance. And number five, number five, this is, this is so true. We see this often. Justifying sinful actions while at the same time professing repentance. See, Saul did that. That any well, God told him clearly, destroy everything. He says, no, but we kept the best so that we can offer them as a sacrifice to the Lord your God. God said, that's forbidden, don't even touch it. Who was Saul to decide what's acceptable to God or not? To obey is better than sacrifice. To obey is better than sacrifice. So that justifying People did it, I didn't. Things like that. Situation, you don't know what I'm going through. No. True repentance is, I have sinned. Not blaming anyone. Not blaming God also. God, if only you didn't put me in this position, I would not have sinned. That's what Adam did. Right? The woman you gave me. So, five characteristics we saw. Let's pick it up. Characteristic number six of false repentance. Repenting only for the sake of others and not because of a love for God. Repenting only for the sake of others and not because we genuinely love God. Saul comes to mind again. Turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 15. It's page 402 in the church Bibles here if you're following with me. 1 Samuel chapter 15, we're going to read verse 30. Actually, it's 404. Uh, 1 Samuel 15 verse 30. So, Samuel has now pronounced judgment on Saul saying, you know, God is displeased with you. I'm not going to go with you. Notice what Saul does when he realizes Samuel is no longer going to go with him. Verse 30. I have sinned. But please honor me. Notice that. But please honor me before the elders of my people and before Israel. Come back with me so that I may worship the Lord your God. He is not focused on worshiping the Lord his God for the sake of rendering true worship. What he is doing here is please honor me. Please honor me. He wanted to appear before people as a truly repentant person. And how to make that cell, so to speak, have Samuel, the man of God, with him. Hey, Samuel's on my side. Look, people, Samuel's on my side. So, I am approved of God. So I'm worthy to be honored as king. It was not from the heart. Second time he said, I have sinned in this passage. It was for Saul, honoring me was more important than honoring God. You can see that in the passage here. See how wishy-washy is throughout this whole incident? But there's another example in the Bible of a false repentance that repents only for the sake of others and not for a love for God. There was a king who ruled Judah. His name was Joash. 
in second kings chapter 12 page 537 we're going to be flipping through some scriptures so you can write it or follow along with me whatever works best for you in page 537 we're introduced to this fellow's obedience or so called obedience in second kings chapter 12 and verse 2 notice what notice what the writer tells us joash did what was right in the eyes of the lord all the years jehoiada the priest instructed him so you had this priest he had a big influence when you read the uh, context there jehoiada had a influence and in the text kind of tells us what's to come it says he did what was right in the eyes of the lord all the years jehoiada the priest instructed him and then come over to second chronicles 24 go a couple of books to the right in second chronicles 24 page 645 notice what else we read after jehoiada is gone from the scene in second chronicles chapter 24 i want to it's page 645 i want to pick it up from verse 17 see the sad turn of events after the death of jehoiada the officials of judah came and paid homage to the king and he listened to them they abandoned the temple of the lord the god of their ancestors and worshiped ashera poles and idols because of their guilt god's anger came on judah and jerusalem although the lord sent prophets to the people to bring them back to him and though they testified against them they would not listen so you see what happened here jehoiada was there as long as he was there Joash was repenting for the sake of him once he died he let the others influence him now he cannot blame the others his heart did not have a love for the lord so there's the bad company comes your true nature comes out ask yourself do i admit my sin and seek to turn from it only because others are looking do i want to appear godly before others or am i really godly it's very important we sometimes love to pretend to be a man or a woman of god but inside we love sin we are not sorry that our sin grieves god do we feel sorry for hurting him when we do wrong things like me i'm sure many of you would have had the sad experience when you have to force an admission of guilt from someone who claims to be a believer you walk away with the feeling something is not right they just acknowledge their sin and their desire to turn from it because they were forced to it just didn't seem genuine again we're not we try to take the high road we say I want to be wrong lord I really want to be wrong for their sake but you just walk away and then actions later tell that they're not truly repentant they just acknowledged because pressure was put on them and this sometimes is often the case where the children of children or young people especially in christian homes they acknowledge their sin to their parents when they're forced and even during those times it's not from the heart it's because they feel pressured sad and then when these people grow up and they sometimes leave home what happens their behavior is totally opposite there is no hunger anymore so it begins you begin to wonder what happened were all those years false or is it just bad company but well, we cannot throw everything on bad company bad company yes it indeed corrupts good character but also when you look at the joash incident you can see each is accountable for his and her own actions was the outward godly life just a show or was there a genuine desire for god because that genuine desire will stay it's not temporary I tell you this old or young born in a christian home or in a pagan home whatever is the case a holy spirit prompted repentance first and foremost repents 
due to a love for God and sorrow for hurting God, not just others. Yes, we should feel sorry when we hurt others, but that's secondary. The first thing is against you and you alone have I sinned. That's the repentance that's produced by the Holy Spirit. And that kind of genuine repentance remains till the very end. Number seven. Number seven. False repentance repents of some sins, but not all. It repents of some sins, but not all. This is the picture of a person divided in heart. Half the heart is for self. The other half is for God. Such a man or woman picks and chooses which sins to turn from and which sins to keep. And people with that kind of a mindset, that kind of a divided heart, soothe their own consciences by saying, I did give up some sins. Look how far I have come. God must be pleased with me. That's why he's in punishing me. And actually things are working out great for me. So, conclusion, it's not so bad that I hold on to some sins. Of course, I cannot become perfect overnight. That's delusional thinking. Person is divided in heart and continues to stubbornly hold on to sins. Now, please understand, I'm not talking about perfection here. We're talking about a mindset, a holding on without, I don't have any intent of giving that up or I don't have any intent of giving that up in the near future, maybe someday. That's not true repentance. That's not Holy Spirit prompted repentance. That kind of repentance, that kind of a false repentance, that kind of a false view towards certain sins and not all is so prevalent. You see often people repent of, you know, this is not right for me. I'm, 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 I'm a chain smoker. I'm an addict. I'm an addict to alcohol or I'm an addict to drugs or I'm an, whatever, you know, or maybe I'm, I'm overworking or whatever is the case. So you make some changes, but then, but then you continue to hold on to other sins like greed, bitterness, anger, impatience, gossip, pornography, self-righteousness, gluttony, pride, you name it. It's very selective repentance. Selective obedience. Jesus said in Matthew 6.24, it is not hard, but it is impossible to serve two masters. We think we are the exception to that. Impossible to serve two masters. You see, Jesus doesn't want part of our hearts. He wants all of it. But when we talk about the kingship of Jesus, There's nothing there that's outside of his authority. Jesus doesn't dialogue with us. Can I get your input? No. He commands. Now sometimes we portray Jesus as this pathetic person begging people to come to him. No, don't misunderstand compassion for weakness. He is king. He commands. Every knee must bow. One way or the other, every knee will bow. We, we cannot serve two masters. James, in James 4.4, 4, page 1724, tells about, the, he gives us warning, perhaps picking up on Matthew 6 from what the Lord Jesus said in uh, James 4.4. 4. This is what James tells those who are divided in heart. He addresses people like that with these words. You adulterous people, right there. He's he's talking about spiritual adultery. Meaning, you have Jesus here, then you have all your other idols. He's talking about in a spiritual sense here. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? See, right there, he uses these two words. Friendship and the opposite, enmity. So he makes it very clear that these are two polar opposites. Friendship with the world means enmity against God. Therefore, anyone who chooses, this is a willful choice you make, he says, you choose to be a friend of the world, you become an enemy of God. You want to live for the world's approval, for the world's praise, you are not a friend of God. You cannot have it both ways. Cannot have it both ways. Saul tried that. Honor me before people, and at the same time, God, I want you. 
to be on my side. I want to make sure that I'm always winning my battles. You cannot have that. That's why, again, we need to ask ourselves, what sins, I mean, think of it right now as you're sitting, as I'm standing here, what sins are we so cherishing, so holding on to that we just won't let go? Sitting there, you're just saying, I cannot let that go. Could be bitterness, could be pornography, could be anger, whatever it is. What sins are you stubbornly holding, saying, I won't let go, and yet at the same time, convincing yourself, deceiving yourself, deceiving myself, all is well, because look how far I've come along. Let me warn you, and myself in this process, a settled attitude, a settled attitude towards selective repentance is still false repentance. Selective obedience is still, in the eyes of a holy God, disobedience. Number eight, eighth characteristic of false repentance, equating reformation as evidence of true repentance. Equating reformation as evidence of true repentance. What do I mean by reformation? Simply means making some outward moral changes, just outside. Clean up a little bit on the outside, but not the inside. Many who do this, they make some outward changes, uh, get rid of some bad behavior, but never have a change in the heart. Never experience new birth on the inside. Yes, where there is a real change in the heart, there will be changes outside. But just outside changes alone doesn't mean inside there has been a change. Our Lord Jesus explained the reality of this in Matthew 12, page 1391. In Matthew 12, he explained this. He gives this imagery here. It's, it's, it's a very nice, uh, it's, it's a deep one. We, we need to make sure we uh, understand this clearly. In Matthew 12, uh, look at verse 43, page 1391, in case I didn't mention that. What Jesus is doing here is the false teachers, um, the, the false leaders of Israel are attacking him. They, they've been seeing sign after sign and they're still demanding signs. So this is what, in that context, he says this, verse 43. When an impure spirit comes out of a person, it goes through arid or dry places, seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to the house I left. When it arrives, it finds the house unoccupied, swept clean and put in order. Stop right there. That picture of unoccupied, swept clean and put in order is about having some outward repentance, outward changes without an inward change in the heart. Ideas, there's no Holy Spirit inside. Just some clean up on the outside. That's the state of this person. Then notice what happens. Verse 45. Then it, that's the impure spirit, goes and takes with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself and they go in and live there because there is no Holy Spirit to resist them. So now the heart is wide open. And the final condition of that person is worse than the first. That is how it will be with this wicked generation. Pointing to the religious leaders in context to oppose Jesus. They put on a good show on the outside. But inside, they were wicked. And later, our Lord in his ministry gave this scathing rebuke to these very same false leaders because they didn't get it. They thought outwardly being moral is good enough. So this is what he tells them in Matthew 23. You're in Matthew 12. You can move forward to chapter 23. Look at what he says in 25 through 28. Boy, he just lays it out. He tells them clearly, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they're full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside also will be clean. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside you appear to people as righteous, 
but on the inside you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness notice statement after statement jesus is talking about everything for you is outside inside is nothing but filth you may fool people you may fool yourself but you cannot fool me is what jesus is saying and that's what mere reformation without true repentance does it just cleans a little on the outside but inside god looks at the heart where there's a heart change there will be change on the outside but you can have a change on the outside without having a heart change a person can give up a lot of bad habits but still not have jesus in the heart in the eyes of a god who sees all things who knows all things reformation without genuine heart transformation is still false repentance ask yourself are you just cleaning a little on the outside but inside inside how is your inside i cannot do that work for you you cannot do that work for me and that is why like david prayed we should always be praying search me o oh god david doesn't say help me to search another person's heart search me see if there is any wicked way in me in me in me that should be the prayer of a truly repentant heart that's the start number 9 ninth characteristic of false repentance equating possession of religion as evidence of true repentance it kind of follows along with the previous one but this gets a little more specific you know a lot of people think i am this religion or even within certain denominations i am this denomination we have the what is that the we have the proprietary rights to salvation to heaven nobody else and the jews were like that because i am a jew there is guaranteed entrance into heaven in fact that there was there was a belief historians tell us that abraham would be sitting at the outside of hell i, I don't think it is true but this was the mindset and we know abraham that's not abraham's job anyway so why would he be doing that so in case he sees a circumcised jew by accident come towards hell he'll push them into heaven meaning just because you're a jew heaven is guaranteed the religious leaders stand as a great example again in matthew 27 judas says i have sinned and he returns the money back to them you know what the religious leaders do we will we'll see that when we get back into matthew 27 they say oh we cannot use that money that's blood money and they would not even go inside pilate's home because they did not want to ceremonially be defiled while they were throwing the son of god to the wolves see they were so focused on maintaining their religion and their rules they lost the truth they lost the truth and this is not new centuries before these pharisees the religious leaders during jeremiah's day they had the same attitude look at jeremiah chapter 7 page 1088 i would like for you to turn to it because i think this is a very powerful illustration uh Jeremiah 7 page 1088 the the background here is the people of Judah were living extremely wicked lives and God was sending his prophets again and again warning them and despite that they felt they were safe why because they were God's chosen people and look at verse 4 of chapter 7 again page 1088 Jeremiah 7 verse 4 this is what God is saying through the prophet Jeremiah do not trust in deceptive words and say this is the temple of the Lord the temple of the Lord the temple of the Lord stop right there what they were saying is hey we have the temple here in Jerusalem temple signified God's presence which means God is with us nobody can defeat us who is this Nebuchadnezzar he cannot do anything to us we're safe we're safe we can continue living any way we want because the temple is here look at god's response we're going to pick it up from verse 9 
Will you steal and murder, commit adultery and perjury, burn incense to Baal and follow other gods you have not known and then come and stand before me in this house which bears my name and say we are safe? Safe to do all these detestable things? Has this house which bears my name become a den of robbers to you? Jesus quotes that in his ministry. But I have been watching, declares the Lord. I have been watching. Go now to the place in Shiloh where I first made a dwelling for my name and see what I did to it because of the wickedness of my people Israel. While you were doing all these things, declares the Lord, I spoke to you again and again, but you did not listen. I called you, but you did not answer. Therefore, what I did to Shiloh, I will do. Now do to the house that bears my name, the temple you trust in, the place I gave to you and your ancestors. I will trust you for my presence just as I did all your fellow Israelites, the people of Ephraim. What, what God is saying is, I don't care about a physical structure. In Shiloh I did that. I'm going to do it here also. And he did it. The temple was dismantled. So people can think, just because I have an affiliation with a particular religion or a particular church, whatever it is, I am safe. God says, I'm watching. I'm watching. You may assume you're safe to do all these things. Nobody may even know. I'm watching. I know the desires of your heart. I know at heart how wicked your motives are. But yet, you cover it up so well. And to the point where you're, you're now deceiving yourself to saying all is well with me. Do not misinterpret God's tolerance as God's approval. Sin is sin, no matter how we cut it. God is not impressed by a mere outward position of religion if it's not followed by true repentance, a true giving up of sin and a true turning to him in faith. And that's why God said these words earlier in verses 5 through 8. If you really change your ways and your actions and deal with each other justly, if you do not oppress the foreigner, the fatherless or the widow and do not shed innocent blood in this place and if you do not follow after other gods to your own harm, then I will let you live in this place in the land I gave your ancestors forever and ever. But look, you are trusting in deceptive words that are worthless. And today we have so much deceptive words that keep coming at us. God of the New Testament. It's a God of grace. So live any way you want. Despite the fact that God is immutable. He does not change. He'll be okay with everything that goes on. God is still the same. Sin still bothers him. Mere words won't cut it. That, that's, that's the point here. Merely being religious does not equate to being righteous. Religion without righteousness is another characteristic of false repentance. True repentance, the Holy Spirit prompted repentance, involves not only a genuine acknowledging of sin, but it also is followed by a desire, a genuine desire to turn from that sin, which will be evidenced by actual turning from sin, turning to Christ in faith and showing a life of obedience. Tenth characteristic, last one for today, a false repentance, repenting temporarily. Repenting temporarily. Once again, Pharaoh comes to mind. We already saw last week, twice, Pharaoh said, I have sinned and continued to sin. What happens later is interesting. Go to Exodus chapter 14, page 96, very early in the Bible. So the story where we pick it up here, Exodus 14 is, Pharaoh has finally let the people go. So Israel has left Egypt. They're on their way to the promised land. 
But then notice in verses 5 through 6 of Exodus 14. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his officials, notice that, changed their minds. They repented of their way of letting the Israelites go. They're turning back to their old ways. They changed their minds about them and said, what have we done? We've let the Israelites go and have lost their services. So he had his chariot made ready and took his army with him. You're familiar with what happened next. God destroyed all of Pharaoh's army by drowning them in the Red Sea. Look at verses 26 through 28 of the same chapter. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so that the waters may flow back over the Egyptians and their chariots and horsemen. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and at daybreak the sea went back to its place. The Egyptians were fleeing toward it and the Lord swept them into the sea. The water flowed back and covered the chariots and horsemen. The entire army of Pharaoh that had followed the Israelites into the sea, not one of them survived. They repented temporarily. God brought about judgment. See, temporary repentance brings God's judgment. Let me give you another example. This is Pharaoh and his officials. They were not believers. They didn't pretend to be God's people. There's another group that pretended to be God's people. Repented temporarily and changed the mind and God brought judgment. Go back to Jeremiah. This time is Jeremiah 34. Page 1135. I'm sorry I'm moving you through scriptures, but bear with me. I hope this helps uh, these truths to sink in. Uh, Jeremiah 34, page 1135. We're going to pick it up from verses 8 through 11. So it's actually page 1136. The word came to Jeremiah from the Lord after King Zedekiah made a covenant with all the people in Jerusalem to proclaim freedom for the slaves. Everyone was to free their Hebrew slaves, both male and female. No one, was to, no one was to hold a fellow Hebrew in bondage. So all the officials and people who entered into this covenant agreed that they would free their male and female slaves and no longer hold them in bondage. They agreed and set them free because they were holding them in bondage which was, which was against God's word through Moses. And uh, so they let them go. Hey, we repented. It was wrong. Let them go. But afterward, look at verse 11, they changed their minds and took back the slaves they had freed and enslaved them again. See, they start out good. They give them freedom. But then they realize, oh, wait a minute, this is going to cost us something. Obedience always costs something. It's going to cost us now. Uh, maybe we need to rethink this. Maybe we were too quick. God really doesn't command that, does he? I think we're being, we're taking Everything too literally. When it hurts the pocket, the checkbook, start rethinking. That's what these people did. They actually repented of their good and turned back to their old ways. Like Pharaoh and his officials. Hey, we lost all this slave labor. Cheap labor. Below minimum wage. We lost all that. Notice what God did in response. Jeremiah 34, beginning in verse 12. Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah after these people took, this, took them back as slaves. This is what the Lord, Yahweh, the God of Israel says. I made a covenant with your ancestors when I brought them out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I said, verse 14, every seventh year, each of you must free any fellow Hebrews who have sold themselves to you. After they have served you six years, you must let them go free. Quoting Deuteronomy 15 verse 12. So God clearly told them, you must, there was no ambiguity here, you must set them free. The seventh year. Your ancestors, however, did not listen to me or pay attention to me. Recently, you repented and did what was right in my sight. So they did do what was right in his sight, but it was only temporary. Each of you proclaimed freedom to your own people. You even made a covenant before me in the house that bears my name. You promised me, God, get me out of this mess. I give you my word. I've changed. See, I've given this up. 
But now you have turned around and profaned my name. Each of you has taken back the male and female slaves. You had set free to go where they wished. You have forced them to become your slaves again. Therefore, there's a consequence. Consequence to your actions. This is what the Lord, Yahweh, the judge pronounces. You have not obeyed me. You have not proclaimed freedom to your own people. So I now proclaim freedom. That word's within quotes. This is what I'm going to do. Declares the Lord. Freedom to fall by the sword, plague and famine. I will make you abhorrent to all the kingdoms of the earth. Those who have violated my covenant and have not fulfilled the terms of the covenant they made before me, I will treat like the calf they cut in two and then walked between its pieces. What's what's Jeremiah's, what's God telling through Jeremiah here? Those days when people make a covenant, they would take an animal, a, a calf or a, a bird's, they will cut them in half, leave the two sides on the side and then in the middle they'll walk through. The idea is this. We're making this agreement. If one of us breaks it, let that be done to us. May we be put to death. What is interesting is, in Genesis 15, God puts Abraham to sleep and God, as a blazing torch, walks through the animals, meaning God's saying, I'm giving you a commitment. I will bless the seed of Abraham. If I break it, may that be done to me. So that is why we're secure in God's promises. But here, they made a promise to God. They cut a covenant. They broke it. So God says, you made a covenant, you broke it. This is what's going to happen to you. The leaders of Judah and Jerusalem, the court officials, the priests, and all the people of the land who walked between the pieces of the calf, they made that covenant. They promised God vividly, clearly, with the sacrifice, we will not go back. I will deliver you into the hands of, I will deliver into the hands of their enemies who want to kill them. Their dead bodies will become food for the birds and the wild animals. I will deliver Zedekiah, king of Judah, and all his officials into the hands of their enemies who want to kill them to the army of the king of Babylon, which has withdrawn from you. I took them away because you repented, but it was only temporary. I'm bringing them back. This time, that's it. I'm going to give the order, declares the Lord. I will bring them back to the city. They will fight against it, take it and burn it down, and I will lay waste the towns of Judah so no one can live there. And God did exactly as he promised. See, that's what temporary repentance brings about. God cannot be mocked. God cannot be fooled. There is a cost to obedience. But we don't look at that cost. We look at the cost of disobedience. Number one, it grieves the Lord who hung on the cross for us. And number two, it does bring judgment upon us. That's why the Bible teaches temporary repentance is false repentance and that will bring God's severe judgment. So 10 characteristics of false repentance we've seen. Let me quickly just read through them again and then we're going to close real soon. Number one, equating feelings of sorrow alone as evidence of true repentance. Number two, confessing sin without turning from it. Number three, repenting only to escape present consequences, not because there's a genuine hatred, a Holy Spirit prompted hatred for sin. Number four, equating penance, earning forgiveness as evidence of true repentance. Number five, justifying sinful actions, coming up with excuses while at the same time professing repentance, saying I'm sorry. Number six, Repenting only for the sake of others and not because of a true love for God. Number seven, repenting of some sins, selective repentance, but not all. Number eight, equating reformation, some outward changes as evidence of true repentance. Number nine, equating having a religion, affiliation with something as evidence of true repentance and the last, but not the least, is repenting temporarily. So you see, just saying I have sinned does not necessarily constitute true repentance. You can say I have sinned and still display 
false repentance. It is important that we acknowledge sin. In fact, to deny that we have sinned is condemned in the Bible. You're in Jeremiah 34, right? Go, go back to Jeremiah chapter 2. It is important. I don't want you to conclude that it doesn't matter whether I say I've sinned or not. It does matter. In Jeremiah chapter 2, look at verses 31 through 35, page 1078. I'm going to pick it up from verse 31. You of this generation, consider the word of the Lord. Have I been a desert to Israel, God speaking, or a land of great darkness? Why do my people say, we are free to roam, we will come to you no more? Does a young woman forget her jewelry, a bride her wedding ornaments? Yet my people have forgotten me days without number. How skilled you are at pursuing love. Even the worst of women can learn from your ways. On your clothes is found the lifeblood of the innocent poor, though you did not catch them breaking in. And notice here it comes. Yet in spite of all this, you say, I am innocent. He is not angry with me. But I will pass judgment on you because you, have, because you say, I have not sinned. He said, I have not sinned. What wrong did we do? If we did so much wrong, why is God blessing us? So God is actually condemning them for saying, I have not sinned. Denial of sin brings forth judgment. Bible clearly tells us, 1 Kings 8.46, there is no one who does not sin. Romans 3.23, all have sinned. Sinned. There was only one man who was sinless, the God man, the Son of God, Jesus Christ Himself. Everyone else has sinned one way or the other. So God is warning the people way back in Jeremiah 2 I will judge you because you don't even acknowledge your sin, let alone seek to truly turn from it. That is why in the previous chapter, or in the next chapter, God tells through Jeremiah, he's actually pleading in one sense to the disobedient nation to acknowledge their sin so they could avoid his judgment. Look at Jeremiah 3 verses 12 through 13. So he tells them, you're saying I've not sinned. That's going to bring judgment on you. Here is a holy, powerful God calling the nation, wooing them back to himself. Go, he tells Jeremiah, proclaim this message toward the north. Return faithless Israel, declares the Lord. I will frown on you no longer, for I am faithful, declares the Lord. I will not be angry forever. Only acknowledge your guilt. You have rebelled against the Lord your God. Only acknowledge your guilt. And that's what God is telling you and me. It doesn't matter how many sins you've committed. Come. Acknowledge. Be washed through the blood of my son. You won't miss this, verse 13. It's such a moving text. Only acknowledge your guilt. Why should God even say this? He would be perfectly right to just pass judgment without even giving an opportunity for us to repent. This should move us. Only acknowledge your guilt. You've rebelled against the Lord your God. You've scattered your favors to foreign gods under every spreading tree and have not obeyed me. What God wants from us is not to hide our sins, to uncover it before him. What we cover, he'll open it one day. But what we open, he'll cover it. That's what he's telling. And interestingly, the New Testament highlights these same two things through one of the most closest of Jesus' disciples, John. In 1 John, and we're going to close with this. 1 John, it's page 1737, way back in the Bible. Last book is Revelation, about three, four books prior to that, 1 John. Please follow with me, and we're going to close soon. In 1 John 1, 8, again, this is the danger of denying sin. Verse 8, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Notice first what he says in verse 8. When we say we don't have any sin, we're deceiving self. Then come down to verse 10. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, 
and his word is not in us. So when we deny sin, there's two things that are happening here. One, we deceive ourselves. And one second, we're saying God is a liar because God has said in his word, everyone is a sinner. But then couched between that, look at verse 9. If we acknowledge our sins, confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Now I understand this has a specific application to believers, but the principle beyond that, the general principle is anyone who is willing to admit their sin and go to Christ, forgive me, I accept your sacrifice, your blood has paid the full price for my sin. I want to be clean on the inside, God. And then we have to do that constantly because we constantly sin. Christians are not perfect people. Christians are ones who understand that they're not perfect. They're never going to be perfect this side of heaven. So that's why they go to the one perfect one again and again and again. So, but you see that don't deny, come. That's God's appeal to each and every one of us. Acknowledge. But don't stop with acknowledging. Go further. Go to Christ. Cling to Him. Father, I come to you through Christ. And the Father will never, ever deny you from entering. That's the beauty of the gospel. And that's why we should ask ourselves, is my acknowledgement of sin mere words? Sometimes we can make long prayers that we've sinned. Long prayers, even cry. Part of genuine repentance, but also part of false repentance because you get up, go back to the same way of living or quit that and then go back again. Temporary repentance. All that is false repentance. I understand when we put ourselves in each of those 10 characteristics, I see myself in all, honestly. There's shades of everything there. So what I'm not saying is our repentance will be perfect. But we need to ask ourselves with the help of the Holy Spirit, is it moving towards the right direction? Moving from self and moving to God by faith in Christ. And is that resulting in a pattern of holy living? It is biblical to frequently examine our lives to see am I truly saved or am I deceived into thinking I'm saved? I'm not talking about getting up every morning with this paranoia, but there should be a holy fear. Lord, is my life showing that I'm truly yours? Where am I really going, Lord? Show me clearly, heaven or hell. You know why we don't want to ask that question? Because we already know that means we have to give up some more sins, and we don't want to. So we don't want God to do a deeper. It's like the dentist, you know. You poke one area. I told you the pain is here. Why are you digging here? They tap with that little hammer. You know, referral pain. We'll deal with that later. Just fix it here. No. We don't want the Holy Spirit to do that to us. Because we already know that's not under your control, Lord. Remember, a divided heart is not a truly repentant heart. Young people, practice a sensitive conscience. We'll deal with the conscience when we deal with Pilate. Develop a sensitive conscience that responds to the word of God quickly. Don't silence it. Because if you develop the practice of silencing at a young age, it will become harder to eliminate later. The longer ice is frozen, the harder it is to break. The heart is like that. You know, we live in a day and age where if young people walk according to the word of God, I'm talking within the professing church, that's an exception. Wow, that teenager is really walking in obedience to his parents. That should not be the exception, that should be the norm. Older people, same thing, it's never too late to start afresh. Never too late. Be repent for the sake of God who is worthy of our obedience. Second is our salvation. Really, it's his, he is worthy. That's why we do everything. 
Put him first. Put him above all things. Lord willing, in the next message, we'll look at what repentance is and what are the marks of true repentance. But in the meanwhile, remember the foundational step that follows acknowledging your sin is putting your faith in Jesus Christ alone. Believing that he took your punishment on the cross and he's calling you to place your trust in him. Come, come, I will make you clean. I will give you new life. And then starts the journey of constantly leaning on his spirit to help us live the life he calls us. And in a life that pursues that, there will always be evidences of true repentance. Father, please work these truths in our hearts by your spirit. We cannot do this. Uh, Jesus, you said you are the light of the world and may your Holy Spirit through this gospel shine light into dark hearts that are here so that they can see Christ, the one who hung on that cross, who lived the perfect life, hung on the cross for our sins so that we could have true life. Yes, Jesus, it's only by your grace we can walk in the light and not in darkness. But even as believers, sometimes we can delude ourselves, deceive ourselves into thinking all is well when it's not. So please, in all our lives, including myself, show us, Lord, those areas where we are wrong. And please, you help us to repent. You help us to turn from those sins that are displeasing in your sight, no matter the cost. We may lose relationships, people may call us fools, but Jesus, we want to be loyal to you. You didn't turn your back on us, so we don't want to turn our back on you. You are indeed worthy. Worthy is the lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. Thank you, Jesus. In your name I pray. Amen.